And uh, it's just an exciting, exciting opportunity. I do need to thank a few people. I want to thank the Murillo Foundation. I, I see uh, Bill Haynes is here. I'm not sure if Chris or, or Blaze are here. Uh, good to see you folks. Thank you so very, very much for your support. Um, and I want to make sure I also thank Sarah Robertson for uh, coordinating for the last two years this event. And I've been talking to folks around the country and uh, we are so pleased that this has kind of uh, hit a sweet spot, getting the word out, uh, bringing together different parts of the country. And that's what I think kind of makes this uh, event somewhat unique in the sense that we're pulling together folks from uh, the uh, headwaters, the Delta. Uh, last couple of times we've talked to folks from Hawaii. Uh, I just actually got back this morning from Hawaii and our friends uh, in Hawaii say hello, our friends in New Orleans and, Mississippi and Minnesota. Um, but without further ado, we'll get started here. Uh, a little home uh, housekeeping. Uh, we will take the chat. Uh, in the chat, please uh, put your questions. We'll be taking those at the end. Uh, so we can, we've usually been able to get to, to any and all questions that have come through. I'll facilitate that after our presenters are done. Uh, keeping the mic on mute uh, is a good idea. Uh, of course, turn on your video off if you'd like, turn it on if you'd like. And uh, the important thing is this uh, event is recorded and uh, we have a lot of folks that don't necessarily join us right away, but thank you for coming tonight. But we can uh, go back and use this as a record of this conversation. Um, with that, let's see, what's the next slide on that um, that we have? Here we go. Um, I want to uh, start with uh, John Shepard first. John has uh, been with uh, at the center for uh, 25 years, uh, is the assistant director in charge of multimedia, but really has been the heart and soul of our storytelling. It's a great honor to have him tonight uh, giving you an update on where we're at with the lines of defense module we're developing. Um, Dinah, uh, and, and Dinah and, and Dr. Bob have been just really good friends. So I, I should have more formal introduction, but I'm gonna use more of a personal connection. Uh, Dinah and John and I uh, paddled down the Pearl River. We had a mar remarkable time. And it's kind of fun when you paddle with somebody, you get to really know them. We had a blast going down that river. Uh, Dinah is a very, very uh, uh, old soul. She really connects and, and uh, gets the job done. Her directorship of the surf program, Coastal Education and Research um, uh, Facility at UNO is, uh, is a labor of love. And I know, Dinah, you put your heart and soul into that. And we have always appreciated coming out there and being part of uh, exploring in, in your area. So, Dinah, thank you so much. Uh, I know that uh, your work at UNO has been very appreciated by them. And uh, we certainly appreciate the energy you put into this. Um, uh, Dr. Bob, I, I have to say that uh, Dr. Bob is an icon. I talk to our friends here uh, and they go, oh, we know him. It's like incredible that um, he has been doing such good work. And um, um, especially, uh, you know, obviously his, uh, his uh, title uh, at Loyola, uh, Professor Distingu Distinguished Scholar, Chair of Environmental Communication, Director of the Center for Environmental Communication. So he's really... Uh, leading the charge after our own heart, communicating about the environmental issues and not just saying, okay, here you go, uh, just take it or leave it. Uh, but I also know he's played a major role, a major role in the, nat uh, the Louisiana nat Master Naturalist. And uh, he has been done a great job with that and done so much research and good work uh, in the tropics. We were just chatting about travel and uh, I hope you get back in the tropics soon, Bob, to uh, get back to your love. But I think it's amazing that he's got such a solid science background and his ability to communicate. Uh, so with that, I will turn this over to, uh, to John to lead us through the night's uh, overview of lines of defense against hurricanes in the Mississippi Delta. So just piggybacking slightly on what uh, Tracy said, it's, it is uh, our center uh, works very collaboratively all around the, the country and uh, we're fairly small. And we only get things done by having good relationships. So just to underscore uh, our many years now of working closely with the Miro Foundation uh, and uh, thanking them again for their support of the webinar series. And then with Dr. Bob uh, was so gracious in, in uh, inviting us down to New Orleans as guests of, of his program to give some presentations. Uh, this was several years ago. And it's really just sort of grown into this relationship. We first met him. Uh, when he was on his way up to the headwaters at Lake Itasca, headwaters of the Mississippi River. And uh, we got to connect with him uh, during that journey and, you know, kind of discovered this shared uh, love and appreciation of this amazing river. 
And uh, it's just fun to be kind of at opposite ends of the river and to be able to collaborate and work closely together. So um, tonight when it's my turn to uh, share some content with you, which will be after uh, Bob and Dinah's presentations, um, you know, I'm gonna be talking about our, uh, showing you, giving you a preview of our lines of defense uh, interactive uh, program. And, uh, you know, it really has grown out of uh, these relationships and, uh, and Bob and Dinah both have been particularly uh, helpful in working closely as we've begun putting this together. So that's all I'm going to say, and I'm going to stop sharing. Bob, you are welcome to um, begin sharing your screen, and um, the, the microphone is passed to you, sir. Okay, I just need to see where to share. Am I turned on for it? You should be, I think. Just click the share button down at the bottom and then select whatever. There you go. It looks like you got it. Did I share yet? We're looking at your PowerPoint. Okay, good. Yeah, and it fills the screen or whatever? It has not filled the screen, so uh, you might want to hit play. That would be me. There you go. Assuming it will do that. There it is. Now you All go. right. We're good? Yes. Okay. Well, it's really a pleasure to be with y'all. And uh, this is what <laughs> Dinah and I and, and all of our colleagues really live to do, is talk about coastal issues in Louisiana. And so, uh, so what uh, uh, John uh, asked me to do tonight is to talk about uh, multiple lines of defense, because that's sort of the theme of his wonderful video that he's going to show you in a little bit as well. So what, uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of use a few slides here to give you an overview of the way we look at what we call multiple lines of defense, MLOD. Um, uh, you know, it is the way we live is my title. And, uh, and it really is. Uh, and, and for us, it's really sort of a, a new term. And, and I'll give credit where credit is due. Uh, Dr. John Lopez, uh, who uh, is now a consultant in the community, but he spent a lot of years as the science director and the director uh, of the what's now the Pontchartrain uh, Conservancy, the old uh, Lake, For uh, Lake Forest, uh, 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 Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation. And uh, when he did his PhD work uh, after a career in, uh, with a, a big company, um, that's sort of what he sank his teeth into was, was looking at, you know, how does this, how does this coastline work for us? And what are the good attributes that we need to, to know a lot about? So um, without further ado, now I've got a couple of slides here that I'm not gonna spend time on because we don't have enough time, but I always start my, slide, my, my talks with a, a human population exponential growth curve and uh, critical thinking skills because without critical thinking skills, skills we're all doomed. <laughs> enough on that. If you're in my class, we'd spend an hour on it. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, the first thing is uh, uh, when, when we have a mixed audience uh, is that we all know what the Mississippi River is, but a lot of times when you talk about the Mississippi River Delta, uh, people kind of look at a map of Louisiana and they look down there in the, in the corner and they see, they, they see the, what's called the Belize uh, subdelta and they think that that's the Mississippi River Delta. Uh, the reality is uh, that this is everything inside of this triangle here, upside down triangle is uh, the Mississippi River Delta. And we're gonna show you a slide in a moment, which a lot of you have seen, I know, because I see a lot of you on these workshops. Um, it's really a series of eight different uh, uh, sub-deltas. Actually, for that matter, some people go up as high as 16. It just depends on how a geologist looks at the framework. But uh, that whole area right there is the Mississippi River Delta. And notice that I'm calling it the Mississippi River Delta. We don't just call it the Mississippi Delta. And you'll see why in just a second. Matter of fact, you'll see it right now. <laughs> if you know the lower part of the, uh, or, or the upper part of uh, Mississippi, uh, that area in green there is, and that's, if people say the Mississippi Delta down here, that's what they're talking about. They're not talking about the mouth of the river, uh, but they say the Mississippi River Delta, uh, then they are communicating about the mouth, uh, the mouth of the river. But this delta region up here has played a major role in the history of the South uh, because of uh, uh, going all the way back into slavery and uh, the plantations and everything else. This was 
always a very important place, but it's also where uh, rhythm and blues and music like that came from. So to all of us, it's a place that, that is much beloved. And then this is the, uh, the official 2000 map of Louisiana. Did you, did you notice if I back up for a minute, look at, look at the shape of Louisiana. This was the official map until 2000. Very, very misleading. Uh, we kind of felt like we had this humongous uh, state that we lived in. And the reality is when they updated it, uh, a lot of that land down there that we all, I remember in my, you know, when I was in college and everything, it was a lot of that was there and it's gone in my lifetime. But it's really important, I think, for us to reflect back at how much of Louisiana has been lost and how much we will inevitably lo lose maybe in the, in the lifetime of some of the people that are on this workshop. Now, this is whence it came. Uh, this is, you know, that area that was in that triangle just now. And I think many of you have probably looked at this before and have studied this, but it's the way the, the river swang, uh, swung back and forth, back and forth, creating uh, uh, deltaic areas. And then they all coalesce. And so it is what it is today the places we live, where we live. And, but geologically, it's about 6,000 years old and, um, and still changing very much. We do try to keep it in place as much as we can, but it's still, it's still got a long way to go. But it's, it's a beautiful area and a, and a, a beautiful study in geology. Uh, when Jacqueline talks about this, it's always very eloquent the way she describes it. Uh, we, we, we were uh, visited by an editor on, on one of our street signs. This is Highway 1 that runs the entire length of, of Louisiana. You look on the left, that's the way all the signs look for the Louisiana highway system. But look at the one on the right, which is, by the way, the same one. Somebody came along and painted it the way it really is now. You see all the, the black areas in there that are now open water. So it's always hilarious the way people will say, you know what, there's something wrong with that sign on the left, so let's make it a more realistic sign. Uh, our beloved diverse wetlands, this is the way they looked, especially back in the 60s when I was an undergraduate, and, uh, and each of those colors in there is a different type of marsh, a different quality marsh, identified, uh, be, able to be identified by different combinations of uh, vegetative species, and because of that, certainly different combinations of animals that live in these areas. Uh, this is a, a very special map because it was done uh, using uh, traditional ecological knowledge of trappers. Whereas a guy that was working in the past who wrote a wonderful book on the, basically the natural history uh, of a, a coastal rodent down here, uh, he went from trapping camp to trapping camp to trapping camp and just sat down with the trappers and said, talk to me about what you do. Talk to me about what you know about the wetlands of coastal Louisiana. And he constructed this wonderful map back in 1941 um, that, um, that uh, was pieced together by using the traditional ecological knowledge of trappers. And, and after that, a number of biologists sort of took that on as a a way of looking at our wetlands and understanding how they work, uh, depending on different uh, combinations of biota. And the big thing that happened here, I mean, if, 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 you, if you could fly over at a high enough elevation and still see our coast, it would still look like it's pretty doggone big, uh, but, and it's still wonderful. But what has happened is that, uh, uh, because of uh, pipeline canals and uh, uh, increased sea level rise and subsidence and all the other things that we talk about in these seminars, um, it has um, uh, changed in the extent of salt marshes versus brackish marshes versus intermediate marshes versus freshwater marshes. And um, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, it's become much, much more uh, salty over the years. So some years ago, we built a couple of uh, freshwater diversions off of the river. And the whole purpose of those, uh, and, and notice I said freshwater diversions. The whole purpose of those diversions was to take from upriver around New Orleans uh, and allow 
fresh water coming down that river from Minnesota and Wisconsin and other, other places like that, shunting it into those areas that were becoming so saline and trying to reestablish uh, the salinity grades that uh, existed back in the 40s and 50s. Now, we are realists. We know that we cannot recreate the wetlands the way they were uh, decades ago. But what we can do is try to emulate the values and try to do set up habitats where we can still get the uh, cultural values, the economic values, and the biological values out of these wetlands. So those two big diversions, uh, uh, Davis Pond and Carnarvon, uh, have been very important down here. But remember, the purpose is to put fresh water to push back the salt water, the isohalanes. And uh, that's different from what we're going to be talking about soon. And I'm sure we'll be doing a big seminar on that in the next season. But uh, at some point, we're going to really have to dig into talking about these sediment diversions that we're doing, whose they will put fresh water into these areas, but their main purpose is to put sediment into these areas so that it can try to replace the uh, subsidence and the like. So uh, that's very important to think about when you look at Louisiana. I, I, I'm teaching my Ecology of the Delta course right now. And one of the things that uh, we're on right now, we're talking about the things that have caused the demise of the coast, you know, going through, I have a list and we go through them one by one. And I told him, I said, what, what's really important to understand is that coastal ecology is extremely complex. And when you move any little part of it, another part of it, like John Muir says, jiggles. And um, uh, if it were easy, we would have fixed it a long time ago. But it's a very complex ecological situation, but very, very interesting intellectually. And here's, here's a map that gives you some, some perspective. Uh, first of all, look at the red down there. That, that land is, that's wetlands that's imperiled. Uh, it's not gone yet, but it's, uh, it's very, very vulnerable. And, um, and what I've done is I've superimposed the state of Delaware in there to show you how much, how much vegetated wetlands and land we have lost in coastal Louisiana since uh, 1932 between 1932 and 2016. It's about the size of Delaware, about 2,000 square miles. And people don't talk about it as much because it's not happening in one place. It's happening a little here, a little there. Now, people my age very much remember in the 60s when we were just getting introduced to, uh, to coastal wetlands and we could go into places where you were just in a basic wilderness of wetlands. Uh, today, that's hard to find, and, uh, and it's also an awful lot of open water down there. But by, by the way, I made this, uh, this map because I wanted my students to see it and to be very much aware of what it looks like to lose 2,000 square miles. But I showed it to a couple of people who talk about these issues all the time, and they said, well, I'm, I'm not going to use the map. And I said, why? They said, well, it's not big enough. <laughs> And I said, but that's the reality. <laughs> that's what's really happening. We've really lost that much. So, but notice that it says there that it's losing vegetated uh, 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 wetlands uh, in water and land. And um, uh, it's, not, it's not just land that's gone away. It's, it's combinations of vegetated uh, wetlands, water as well. Now, here's, here's John's, uh, uh, John Lopez's artwork. It's now been enhanced. It seems like every time I turn around, somebody's adding something to it. But this was sort of the essence of his uh, PhD research. And he sat down as a, as a person with a lot of geological background and just looked closely all across the coast. And he started to see similarities in different places. And what he did is he came up with this little drawing that shows you that one of the things that protects coastal Louisiana is not just one thing, not just a levee, not just a, uh, a, a salt marsh or something, but it's a combination of all the things that are both natural and uh, human made along the coast. So what you see, if you'll go off to the left there and look at offshore, um, the offshore waters, uh, as you come toward land, 
any kind of storm surge or uh, any kind of movement of salt water or anything else as they come ashore, uh, the first thing they hit are these salt marshes in the estuaries along the edge. And they may also hit barrier islands. We've got a lot of barrier islands. We've only got one that's inhabited. That's Grand Isle, but the rest of them are very much there. And we hope that they stay there forever because they're just wonderful ecosystems, parts of the ecosystem. And, uh, and then if the water gets across that, then it usually gets into a, a, a brackish marsh or, or actually just, we call it the back swamp right behind those, you know, a, a lagoon is another name for it. The sound on this, on this image here. Um, but, then, but then you get into uh, to brackish marsh uh, and then you'll have number four is, a, is what, what he calls a, a marsh land bridge uh, where you have, a, depending on the salinity in there, you'll have a variety of different types of marshes. And then you may have a natural ridge or you may have a series of natural ridges. So the water kind of has to go across that. Those natural ridges typically in coastal Louisiana have live oak trees growing on them, uh, maritime forest. And um, uh, so that gives them even more stability and those trees are very adept at living in those kind of conditions. Uh, if anybody lives down there, they, they have to elevate their houses and uh, so that they don't get flooded in, uh, in storm events and the like. But they're natural ridges and, uh, and they have, they're, either sur they're usually surrounded by what we call intermediate marsh. Louisiana is really the only place uh, that recognizes intermediate marsh. We have such, such vast marshlands that we can actually dissect them out a little bit more. But then you'll go through there, you keep coming toward land and you'll, you'll hit highways that run through that have been built on levees that are man-made. And that's another speed bump, if you will, for the water coming in and filtering out salt and all those things that happen in wetlands. And then behind that might be freshwater marsh. And then there may be a big floodgate that's, that's built on a big uh, uh, concrete wall that's sitting on or near a, a levee. And then behind that may be swampy areas with cypress trees and, uh, and, and tupelo gum and things like that that are uh, not a marsh, they're more of a swamp. Uh, and we did find after Katrina that there were some places where the levees did not break in St. Bernard Parish. And the reason was because they had uh, good stands of cypress trees and, and tupelo uh, in those areas. So it sort of broke the, the power of the surges coming in that, uh, in other places, broke the levees. And then eventually you're going to hit a man-made levee. Uh, and it may be 17 feet tall, or if it's along the river, it may be 25 to 27 feet tall. And, uh, and that's sort of the ultimate, you know, behind that levee, people can qualify for insurance. They can buy insurance on their property. It may be very expensive, but they can buy it. And, uh, uh, and people live right up against that levee, as a matter of fact, and certainly anywhere behind it, the city of New Orleans is behind levees, as well as all the other uh, cities and living areas down in this part of the world. And, um, uh, and then trees and everything else going on there. And then house, houses back there may or may not be elevated, but more and more people, especially in the, the deeper reaches of the, the wetlands further down, uh, tend to, uh, to elevate. My son has a, a camp in Reggio, and it's outside the levee system though, but, but it's, a, it's a converted trailer, large one, and uh, it's 17 feet off the ground. And it's been safe in all the storms since Katrina. And, uh, but that's an extra expense, but it's also an extra thing that people do for the places that they love. And um, so, so anyway, so that's number 10 on the list. And then notice on the right-hand side, it's got evacuation and a guy running away. I've got another slide here that John did that has parked by that house a, a car that part of that uh, multiple lines of defense is your car is always full of gasoline and you're ready that when all else fails, when all those speed bumps out there fail to stop the water when it's coming in, you get in your car and drive away. So evacuation is still a real important part of living uh, in the Mississippi River Delta. And then notice at the top, number 12 shows insurance money coming in to the system. So at some point, uh, if you're insured, uh, hopefully you'll get some money back for all that investment that you made so that you can uh, 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 rebuild 
uh, the way you wanted to and, and other ways. Now notice number nine, I wanna go back to that one because I didn't say anything about it, but that uh, uh, internal water management inside the levee system is a whole new way of thinking in New Orleans where we used to, all we thought about was getting that water out of here, pumping it out into the wetlands around us, getting it out of the places we live. And today, because of uh, David Wagoner, uh, Wagoner of White Wagoner and Ball Architects, uh, we've adopted a whole new attitude about how to manage that water, uh, not necessarily getting rid of it, maybe keeping it inside the levees to keep the soil hydrated so that it doesn't subside as much. So with John Lopez's work on the MLOD, followed by David Wagoner uh, and his work on uh, coming up with a new internal water management system, uh, uh, we're, we're, we really approach these issues differently. And, uh, and, and it's, it's fun educating people. We at Loyola do a lot of educational programs uh, in this field with water management and the like, uh, with all age groups. And, and other people that are on this call have been very involved in that as well. Uh, Bill Haynes and his group have done tremendous work and have funded tremendous work. Dinah does it day in and day out uh, and others that are on the call. So that's when, when you say multiple lines of defense in New Orleans, this is usually an image that comes to people's minds is this right here, but let's go to the next slide. And there are other ways of looking at lines of defense. And you're going to see in the end here, John Shepard's going to show his. But look at this map right here of, you know, New Orleans is up there where number four is. You see Lake Pontchartrain. Um, but all of those things are high ground areas, some of which have been enhanced and some of which have not, uh, that act as those speed bumps as well. And they're major speed bumps. And, uh, you know, the other one was diagrammatic. And it kind of shows you in general the way it is all the way across the coast. But these are major areas, many of, like I said, have, have been enhanced. Many of them have levees around them. Some of them don't, but these are, are other lines of defense. Uh, and so some wetlands ecologists will think of this image right here when you bring that up. And then here's just a little repetition, but here, here's another Louisiana Coastal Lines of Defense image that I like to use in my classes. I'm sorry, it's a little bit fuzzy. I didn't realize that until I just looked at it at this size. But uh, again, you see all those hatched areas, the green hatched areas on the right-hand side going all the way out west where the terraces are built and everything. And those are more multiple lines of defense uh, that protect our coast. I mean, I just can't say it enough how important those things are. And if they're diminished, we're in more and more trouble. So we spend a lot of time and money and energy figuring out ways to make this system work better. And here's one final picture of an MLOD. Again, sort of a blow up here where it shows some of these things and they're labeled. And, and my slides are, you know, my slides are available through the, the team here. So if you want to get these and uh, sit down and look at them a little bit more closely, please do that. Uh, it would be wonderful to have people see this stuff a little bit more. You see right there at the top of that is the more traditional MLOD, but drawn a different way with, with some explanation. So I think the repetition is good. To, you see the car parked all the way on the left, full of gasoline, ready to go. So that's part of living here as well. Uh, and I wanted to throw, I've got two slides right here to throw in. And these, these go back to 1994. They were in a publication that the late and great Woody Gagliano, uh, he published so many papers on how to live in coastal Louisiana and how to adapt to the uh, vagaries of our, uh, our region. And, uh, and he, he published his paper in 94 where he, he, he actually put out a, uh, this map of what he called defensive measures. He said, by gosh, it's just like playing football. You've got to have a defensive line and you can't let people run through that defensive line, otherwise you lose. And so Woody was really trying to use that metaphor, that football metaphor to talk about uh, where the lines of defense needed to be in coastal Louisiana. Uh, in 1994. Now, of course, you would alter them now if you uh, redid the studies and made a new map, but it's still pretty doggone good and uh, uh, fun to really sit and contemplate and look at if you know South Louisiana. So, I mean, he's got things on there like on the right-hand side, close the MRGO. Well, it's closed now. Well, it's closed to 
it's closed in the sense that that uh, salt water is inhibited from moving in and out the way that it did, but it's still an awful lot of open water down there and uh, a lot of damaged wetlands. And at some point, we've got to figure out how to deal with that. And maybe some people think these uh, sediment diversions are going to uh, going to help us in that area, but we shall see. I do know that everybody's focused on on safety, but there's lots of different opinions on how we reach that, what the most efficient way to do it. And so by attending these seminars, you'll hear a lot of that discussion. And here's the, the, the uh, 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 paired map. And he said, you have to have a good offensive line and some good running backs if you're gonna be able to go out and, uh, and, and uh, push the ball downfield. And here is where Woody was opining on how uh, with his knowledge at that time, and most of us consider Woody to have been the brain behind all of this stuff going way back into the 50s. And, uh, uh, and so th this is his offensive measures where he, he published a plan and uh, proselytized all over the place. Anybody that would listen to him, he went and talked to him about how this defensive and offensive system would work. So I think you'll enjoy taking a good look at that. And then I put this map in here just to show you. It's a relief map of Louisiana. And you see all that green along the coast and going up into the alluvial plain. You know, the, the brown stuff is our high ground. I think the highest place in, in, uh, in Louisiana is 400 feet above sea level elevation. So uh, <coughs> if we have any kind of major catastrophes in the world that, that uh, cause a large increase in sea level, all of that stuff that's green there is probably going to be underwater. So that would be a, not only a tragedy for Louisianians, but it would be a tragedy for uh, people in North America uh, and around the world as well. So, uh, and then I, I want to show you this one. This is a map that was done some years ago uh, where we were trying to get a handle on what does it look like in, in, along coastal Louisiana if sea level comes up one meter? What if it comes up two meters? What if it comes up a half a meter? And we had a series of maps that we all looked at and, and it caused a lot of discussion. But if we had one meter, three feet came up, look at that, all of that area, which is all of New Orleans, all around the lake. Lafayette is almost underwater itself there. Lake Charles will be right on the edge. Lots of small towns, but, but large towns like Homa and uh, Thibodeau and places like that uh, would, uh, would be underwater. And so we've got to keep that in mind. And, and we're reminded of that just a couple of weeks ago when the uh, uh, C-37 ice shelf in the Eastern Antarctic collapsed. And that's what the middle of this slide is. It's all that collapsed ice and with snow and everything else right at the, uh, out into the open, the black area is open water and all the white stuff is, uh, uh, is glaciers. And nobody expected a collapse like this on the Eastern side, the cold side of Antarctica, but it happened a couple of weeks ago. And immediately the glaciologists who work in this area uh, said, okay, what is the worst case scenario if something like this happened? Because as long as that ice shelf was sitting there bumped up against and attached to uh, Antarctica, uh, those ice sheets that were on land would sit still and not move. And of course the ice shelf had already displaced water. So sea level was not coming up. Uh, it's not gonna come up because it broke off and floated away. But what happens now is nothing's holding those glaciers on. And if a worst case scenario occurs, they're now saying that world sea level rise over a period of time, nobody's putting a date on it, uh, could go up 160 feet, gang, 160 feet. That would be devastating to the world, the 8 billion people that we're about to, to have, because most of us live along the edges of continents and they would all be underwater. Now, the last time something like this happened that scared us uh, was about uh, 10 or 15 years ago when the Larson B shelf broke off up on uh, the top, up there where the archipelago is. And uh, uh, we even, I, I was with a team uh, headed by Tom Mulliken that uh, we were doing some filming and, and some discussion of climate change. And we went down and we were going to go film the Larson B. Uh, after it fell. And you know what? 
we couldn't get to it because all the ice occluded the passageway where our boat would go. And then ultimately it all recoalesced and uh, is still holding those glaciers on land. So you don't know what's gonna happen here, but worst case scenario is not good for anybody. And then I threw this in there. This is just a map that shows you coastal Louisiana. For those of you that have never been down here, uh, and, and I wanna point something out here. Uh, can y'all see my, my uh, pointer there moving? Can y'all see that? I don't think we can. Okay. Uh, but if you look right in the middle, kind of going down to the right-hand side, you'll see those green looks like fingers sticking down like that. Those are actually areas uh, where there is development. All those little, looks like they really go straight down that look like little extrusions. Those are all areas inside the levee system where businesses and people's homes, insured properties, and we call those developmental corridors. So as long as you're inside of that area, you can qualify for, for insurance on your property, on your businesses, and, uh, and you're protected by levees, which are generally very, very good. But outside of those areas where it gets darker, uh, there are people that live out there. They're taking a big chance because they don't qualify for insurance. And if their businesses are out there, they, they're extremely vulnerable. And that's the way life is in Louisiana. If you're down on the coast, you've got to be concerned about where you live and what kind of protection you have and what kind of ultimate protection you can afford uh, to pay for. So that's the reason that that's in there. If anybody wants to talk about that later, we can certainly go back to it. And this is the last slide that I'm going to use here. This is another Gagliano slide. And he published this. I'm trying to put a date on it right now. Uh, uh, I think it was probably around eh, somewhere in the mid 80s when this color rendition came out. And what he was doing here, this was the first color, all color map that was put out where it brought home. Now notice on the legend over there, the different colors tell you where there's, where, where there's uh, uh, how many acres per square mile per year are being lost. And the red are the most severe. And you see down around the Belize Delta, you see under uh, Bayou Lafourche there, uh, on the West Coast. Those are the most severe loss areas. But before that, everybody kind of got this feeling, the way everybody talked, that it was happening all across the coastline. But what was really happening was there were hot spots and there were growth areas where, where literally there was not much loss and or there was growth, like at the mouth of the Atchafalaya. So this was a very, very, very important map to us because it gave everybody a sense of vision for what things, how things were really happening, even though it's not real specific, it till, still tells you more about it. And I can show this at a Rotary Club meeting or a leadership meeting or something like that, and everybody in the room comprehends what's going on in Louisiana. So sometimes maps like that are extremely important. So that's the end of my slides, and uh, we'll turn it over to Diana or wherever John wants to go. But uh, you've got my contacts here if anybody wants to contact me. But I am going to uh, tonight send these slides up to uh, Minnesota. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Bob. That was uh, fantastic um, laying the groundwork for uh, the rest of our evening here. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass the baton on to Dinah. Um, and uh, Dinah, do you want to go ahead and share your screen or? How do you want to proceed? I will. I can, okay. I, but I was going to just uh, do that in a second because I'm going to show a little video first. Okay. So I'll share it in just a moment. And uh, thank you, John. And thank you, Bob. And that was that's a, always a hard act to follow, Doctor Doctor Bob, who I've worked with for about thirty years now. So <laughs> at least. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not at least. So, um, <laughs> but a long time, I think it is 30 years now. So um, anyhow, I'm going to kind of change tack a tiny bit and um, think about um, a way to uh, actively involve, a way that I've come up with to actively involve learners of all ages in um, thinking about this concept of lines of defense. So my, daily day in day out job involves uh, 
teaching many audiences of different ages. And um, so I'm always looking for ways to actively involve people in their learning process. And so a few years ago, I borrowed some ideas from other people and put them together and um, came up with a model to, um, to introduce the idea of lines of defense to um, actually from little kids to really big kids. So um, I uh, guess I will start by showing you this little video and I'm going to skip over, I'm gonna see if I can just skip over some of this because I don't wanna be repetitive. Bob did a beautiful job explaining the actual 11, 12, 13, however many lines of defense we uh, count now. Um, and so I'm gonna skip over that little bit of the video. But um, so the bit, we did this video in the depths of the pandemic. And I found one student who I was able to work with, who happened to be coming with her, her dad, who was going fishing at Surf, which is our, our uh, little field station, which is outside the levee. So it's, great, uh, it's a great place to teach about these things. So she became the star of this video and she's a third grader. So um, we're wearing our masks outside and um, using the model. So I'm gonna share, uh, I don't have it queued up properly, I'm sorry. I will share in a second. Okay, here we go. It's cool, and I'm out here learning about the wetlands. Um, I'm eight years old, and I'm in third grade. Hi, I'm Dinah. Hi, I'm Simone. And we are learning about the coastal lines of defense strategy. And I'm going to explain to Simone a little bit about what we have on this diagram. So if, if Simone, if you live in this little house here, and there's a hurricane coming from the Gulf of Mexico, which is out here, then you are protected by all of these things on our diagram here, which we call the lines of defense. Well, we have the shallow water here, which slows down the storm surge, which is the high water that comes in um, with a hurricane. And then you have a barrier island here, which is the little narrow islands that are just off the shoreline. And they act like a speed bump and slow down the flooding and the high waters. They reduce the high water and the energy that the water um, has. And then th the storm surge will go into this um, area called the sound, which is another shallow water area. And that means that it can't get any bigger when it's there. And then it gets the marsh. And the marsh is where all those, the grasses and the vegetation can um, absorb a lot of the energy and it reduces the flooding even more. And if you have really healthy marsh, you can do a much better job than if you have a unhealthy marsh. So we want nice healthy marshes. And then as you get further inland, you're gonna start seeing trees and these things called natural ridges, which are little areas of higher ground and um, where you see more um, trees and shrubs growing and people might have houses built on them like that. And then as, so all of those things I just described are natural things. They're just part of nature, right? So they're natural things that protect us. And then further inland, we have these man-made things and those include the highway. And we have a highway right over there as an example. And when this flooding gets the highway, the highway might, might be elevated a little bit and it acts like a little levee. And then it gets to our floodgates and levees. So you know what a levee is, right? And um, earlier today, you drove through the floodgate, right? Yeah. In the levee. So you saw what that was like. So those things are man-made things that are built around the city to protect us from this storm, protect our levee. We've talked about what that means, that, we, that Simone's job is to use these materials that we have here to um, and the various clays and so forth to make the lines of defense that we see on this diagram. And her job is to protect the city down here 
from a storm surge, which is going to come very soon um, from the Gulf of Mexico. And so when we roll the marbles down, that's going to simulate the, um, the storm surge coming from the Gulf. So Simone, are you ready? Yes. Okie dokie, take it away. Let's look at the damage from the storm surge. So uh, I see that some of the marbles are trapped behind the barrier islands. So they did their job. And also some of the marbles are trapped in the uh, marshes and in the forested wetlands. And some of the marbles did reach the levee, but none of them went through or over the levee. And our city is safe from the storm surge. And the house that Simone built out in the wetlands did fine because it's elevated and built in a way that can withstand being out in the storm surge. Um, so there may be some things that we can do to improve our wetlands and maybe restore them so that they can protect the levee even better. So um, maybe we can think about that. So that is the basic model. And it's very easy to make. And I'm gonna share some slides in a second, which I'll also put uh, the link in. Just it. close the account. We're selling the business. Oh, We're I'm not gonna be here anymore. Hold on close second. the account. Oh, you don't understand English. I don't wanna close. Sorry, I had to stop the next video <laughs> that started to play. I don't know if you could hear it, but I could. So, um, Anyhow, so that model is very easy to make. Anybody can make it because I can. And um, so uh, I'm gonna share some uh, slides. I'm sorry, I'm doing a bad job here with my new, new share. There we go. Okay, so. So, um, so understanding these lines of defense that Bob described so well, um, uh, you know, you have to uh, know a little bit about storm surge to really understand how they um, they protect us and how, um, as we say, levees are not enough. We need these natural features on the landscape to protect us and our levees that surround the communities. And not every community is, is um, protected by a levee either. So, um, so these features that Bob described so well are so important. And the reason is because we so frequently get these storm surges. And um, we are uh, I'm assuming that most of the people or everybody in our audience today knows, understands what a storm surge is. Um, but uh, when, when a hurricane's in the Gulf, we're told that, you know, the category of that hurricane, and that's based on wind speeds, which is not always the, you know, the wind is not always what we worry about the most because the storm surge can be the, the most destructive and deadly, deadliest part of the hurricane. So, um, so, um, I've included in my slides here um, a little clip that's very quick. And let me know if you're seeing this clip, whether I switched over, are, are we seeing it? Okay. 
So this is a little clip that explains how those categories relate to this, the height of the storm surge. So, and, and what those actually would look like in this simple little uh, animation. So as we go through our categories of hurricanes, what that would actually look like on a shoreline and what it would look like in terms of your house sitting on the shoreline. So you could think of perhaps Grand Isle in Louisiana, which is a barrier island. So we, uh, in the fall, we had Hurricane Ida and Grand Isle was devastated by Hurricane Ida, which was a category four storm. So we're seeing here what that looks like on the shoreline. But those uh, storm surges move way inland and our, our coast is very, very flat. Um, and um, let me see if I can go back to my previous slide. I guess I can go, let's see. I guess I can go. No, I'm gonna have to stop share. I'm sorry, I'm screwing up. I'm really tired. I spent the day with with fifth graders and I guess I got worn out. So I'm gonna stop share and I'm going to <laughs> go back to my slides and do a new share. Okay, and then go on to my next slide, hopefully. It's not advancing. Um, I don't know why my slides are not advancing. Um, anyway, I really would like to show. Cosmic is a constellation of satellites that orbit the Earth and provide measurements of temperature, pressure, and, and moisture in the atmosphere. These measurements are important and it helps weather forecasting because it gives us a, an understanding of what the atmosphere is doing at different levels in the atmosphere. Cosmic One program, which was six satellites launched in 2006, was sponsored by a number of of agencies, the National Science Foundation, NOAA, and UCAR actually carried out the program under, with the sponsorship of the- I know, we, we can't see that video if, if you're playing a video. National Space Program Office in Taiwan. We can hear it, but I don't, we can't see it. And zero and lift off. With the advent of new space technology and the ability to launch larger amounts of math. So, um, I'm so sorry. That's entirely my, I'm <laughs> way too exhausted to do this right now. And I really apologize for that mess up. Um, I was unable to advance my slides and now I'm back online, I'm sorry. Um, so anyway, Bob has shown this uh, map already showing the, um, the a map view of our lines of defense. And we could, um, and I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm just, I'm sorry. Yep, you're back, you're back. Uh, yep, we can see everything that you're doing. Okay, I'm so sorry, apologize. No, you're doing great. So we great. can take a slice out of any part of our coast and illustrate our lines of defense. And um, so um, I'm just gonna show this little clip that shows that it's not just the little kids that can, do, can use this model. This is like a few seconds long. It was going to be a few seconds long, but it's not going to. <laughs> wow. So one thing um, about the model, the simple basic model, is that it's very inaccurate <laughs> um, because our coastline, like Bob said, is vast. And um, if we take any of those cross sections, you could have a hundred kilometers of coast from your town where you might be a couple of meters, one or two meters above sea level 
to the barrier islands and you would have coastal wetlands between you and the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but to illustrate that, we have to scrunch our coast up and we have to exaggerate the height. So with our model that we use to try to illustrate this and get people involved in learning about it, it's always going to be very inaccurate. And so I challenged some high school students to uh, start thinking about scale. And um, so without getting into the math here, the takeaway is that um, it's um, really not practi practical for us to try to build a model that's truly to scale for our coast because it is such a flat, vast coast. And so even if you had, I tried to build it with a 20 foot long piece of um, board and um, try to make it to scale, your levee uh, would then be about a millimeter high if you do the math. And so then are our marbles going to be good, um, um, uh, a good use, a, a good representation of our storm surge? They would be like three, mile, three miles high, right? So maybe BBs would help. And so um, a BB is three, three millimeters in diameter. I don't know if they all are, but the ones I have are. And um, so that kind of is getting closer to reality, right? But it would still be three times as high as that one millimeter levee. So, um, so it's very challenging. And if you want to see a, a scale model of the coast, you could go to the LSU Center for River Studies, which is a fantastic place to go visit to see um, a scale model of these things that we're talking about. Um, so um, I am um, going to really kind of, you know, stop there, just uh, show you a few more slides of kids um, building these models. I, Maureen has, uh, Maureen Misavage, who is on the call, I think still, um, has uh, helped me with teaching, of, teaching with these models and so have many, many volunteers. And each person who uses the model to teach does it differently. And each group that uses the model to build their lines of defense does it differently. So you can see all these different variations on the theme. And um, you can make the model, I'm gonna drop this link into the chat after I finished. Um, it's very, very simple and it's fun to do. And um, you can um, make a different scales of them. You know, you can, you can go further uh, than the basic model if you want to. So I'm gonna stop there and hand it over to John, back to John. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. So thank you, Dinah. Um, it's just been fun to see that uh, model um, in action when we've done our uh, uh, Delta Institutes previously. And so I uh, can just attest that it's a great uh, learning tool and um, encourage you to take advantage of her upload into the chat of the directions for how to, how to make such a thing. Um, so thanks again. I'm going to share with you uh, briefly, just for uh, probably 10, 15 minutes here, give you an overview of uh, work we are doing to incorporate the ideas you've been hearing from Dr. Bob and from Dinah into an interactive multimedia format. <clears throat> and um, in doing that, first, I'm going to just play, place a, a little bit of context for you. Hang on, let me get rid of my controls here. Um, uh, I Hide floating meeting controls. So I'm um, going to just briefly mention this large uh, interactive program, Waters to the Sea Mississippi River Adventure, that uh, is a repository for content that we are creating and many of our partners. So ultimately, um, the resources Diana was sharing, the uh, new interactive resources that I will be sharing with you are going to be available through this Mississippi River adventure. And uh, we've been doing a lot of work in the Delta uh, over the past few years, and this is a, a subset of the uh, Mississippi River uh, Waters to the Sea program that I was just showing there. And this really is a, is a, um, a journey back in time over the last 200 million years up to the present day and looking into the future around um, the geology and ecology and the human impacts on this coastal system. So uh, 
we have the first element here. I'm not going to play these because we've highlighted them in previous webinars. Uh, Ancient Origins of the Gulf is a um, about a four minute uh, video visualization we developed with uh, Jacqueline Richard uh, going back 200 million years to the formation of the Gulf of Mexico, the early formation of the Mississippi River Delta. The birth of the bird's foot delta takes a deep dive uh, into how the modern delta was formed. Bob talked about aspects of that. Uh, we've recreated visualizations developed by Dan Swenson with the Times-Picayune and the Advocate um, around the year 2007. So those that uh, very rich interactive is available through the birth of the bird's foot delta. And then we have a uh, an additional module we created about a year ago that is all about the uh, ecosystems of the Delta environment. And uh, this has multiple sections. You can see the bottom of the screen uh, where you can do a deeper exploration of these key uh, env environmental areas, forested wetlands, ridges, four kinds of marsh that have been talked about, estuaries and barrier islands. And that's really looking at how do these natural systems work? Uh, you know, what was there and functioning after the modern Delta was formed, but before there were substantial human impacts. So those are the ecological pieces. And then what I'm going to show you tonight is uh, a new addition that's going to go into this final segment, which is people, problems, and possibilities. And uh, so this is our uh, learning interactive that uh, is going to focus on the, this concept of the lines of defense. Uh, so you've got a good background from our previous presentations about, you know, kind of what, what this means overall. And the idea here, you can see uh, this familiar map of coastal Louisiana and multiple hotspots around the map. And each of these hotspots is, uh, goes deeper into a particular strategy used in the lines of defense. And then I will show you what that means. Um, the bottom left, there's a legend. And these little icons along the bottom, it probably is a little small for you to see uh, in this particular uh, format. Um, but these icons are drawn from the Coastal Louisiana Master Plan and they're grouped. So the ones, the group on the left, there are six of them. These are restoration strategies. And the idea here is using nature to rebuild um, coastal wetland areas that have been diminished over time through human, primarily through human impacts. So this is about using this idea of biomimicry. How did, how was the Delta built originally? What were the forces that um, uh, nature uh, used or that, you know, these net, what were the natural forces that built the uh, coastal Louisiana uh, Delta environment? And the idea with these strategies is to use those principles to regenerate and uh, restore and support uh, these natural systems. And then on the right are two more. These are titled risk reduction. And these are uh, more structural or engineering kinds of strategies that uh, aren't based on natural processes so much, but on human activities. Um, so just to give you a preview of what's in here, there's quite a bit of content and this is still a, a work in progress. Uh, it's not uh, quite ready for prime time. So this is really a preview uh, that we're able to offer here. So uh, have a brief video that that uh, is touched on in some ways by what we heard before, but uh, it's a little different. 6,000 years ago, the Mississippi River began building its current delta with sediment carried by the river from its huge watershed. Regular floods spread the sediment onto lands beside the river causing the delta to grow wider and extend farther into the Gulf of Mexico. But rivers always seek the shortest available route to the sea, and in time, the Mississippi changed course. A new delta lobe began to form as the first was abandoned. No longer receiving fresh sediment from the river and eroded by waves and storms, the old delta lobe slowly sank or subsided and barrier islands formed along its outer edge. This process, which took place gradually over hundreds of years, has been repeated five times. It has created one of the world's great deltas with vast wetlands that sustain an incredible bounty of life. If the river had had its way, the Mississippi already would have found yet another route to the sea, following the course of the Atchafalaya, 
and the current bird's foot delta would have been abandoned. But this process was interrupted. Repeated flooding made life difficult for the growing city of New Orleans, which was established in 1718. After a major flood in 1927, large levees were constructed on both sides of the Mississippi. The levees have restrained the river to its current course and prevented floods, but at a cost. By channeling the river, the levees have also cut off the Delta's coastal marshes and estuaries from the nourishing sediments they need to thrive. Since the levees were built, barrier islands have been lost and vast areas of marsh have become open water due primarily to subsidence and erosion. The threat of land loss has increased by rising sea levels due to climate change. As these trends continue, New Orleans and other Delta communities are more and more vulnerable to hurricanes and the tremendous destruction they can bring. To address this problem, a huge undertaking has been launched to revitalize coastal environments using some of the same processes that created them. Putting these natural forces to work, a process known as biomimicry, promises to help restore and preserve the Delta's natural systems. Healthy barrier islands, marshes, and estuaries are essential parts of the multiple lines of defense that will reduce the impacts of hurricanes in the years ahead. So there's a quick overview. And, and the emphasis there, the idea is to, is to really identify these, uh, again, these natural forces that have built the multiple lobes of the delta over time, because those same forces are critical to some of the key strategies that are being enacted today. So um, I'll click on this other uh, link here, causes of land loss. This allows you to do a quick review, if you're familiar with this, or a quick introduction to the primary forces that are responsible for um, for land loss along along the levee and or along in the Delta region. Um, and these are all uh, come from the visualizations by Dan Swenson of the Times Picayune. I'll play one of them very quickly. They're very very short. The Mississippi River springtime floods plagued New Orleans for two centuries until levees protected the city and created stable channels for shipping. But the levees also cut off sediment-rich floodwaters that built the land on which the city sits and that kept alive coastal marshes that helped protect the city from hurricanes. So that's very short, very succinct, but quickly uh, gives a uh, visualization of the impact of levees, uh, why they were built, and uh, some of the consequences. So you can go through these saltwater intrusion, sea level rise, canals and channels, uh, subsidence, and invasive species to kind of get a sense of what those forces are. Now we're working with uh, Louisiana Sea Grant, really excited to be partnering with them. And uh, it says, start here, Wax Lake Delta. And we're gonna focus on that as a starting point in this journey, um, once you've kind of gone through those introductory elements, because this is really about, uh, uh, it really showcases the, the land building, the natural land building that occurs in a, in a healthy uh, coastal uh, delta area. So I have just one visualization I'm going to play here. There's no audio with this. This is just showing uh, over the years, you can see uh, ticking by at the top left corner there, how the Wax Lake Delta at the mouth of the Atchafalaya River has developed. And we have a whole series of visualizations like this and uh, aerial um, drone videography that do a wonderful job of showing what the dynamics are of a healthy, growing delta environment. And I think uh, part of the feedback, the Pontchartrain Conservancy is one of our partners um, and uh, talking with them, one of, the, one of the things they were stressing is the need to kind of build a strong sense of hope. Um, you know, a lot of this news is, is disturbing and scary for folks that, uh, um, you know, are concerned about their livelihoods living in this region. So. Uh, we're going to kind of build up and, and kind of hold up the, the um, Wax Lake Delta story kind of as a, as a, as a uh, way of kind of showing what's possible through some of these strategies. So that every one of these I'm showing, there will be more content for them. Well, some of them are fairly complete, but there will be more added to that one. Um, working with Quipra and Jacqueline Richard, we, if you were with us for our last, um, our last webinar, 
um, Jacqueline was showcasing this interactive. So this will be fully in integrated into this program, the Kamenata Headland story. And this is, uh, as you can see, multiple links and resources that are documenting uh, efforts uh, along this barrier island um, that is, you know, looking at the both the, the rebuilding of marshes immediately on the backside of the beach area here and also restoring, doing some engineering work uh, to restore conditions along the beach itself. So this is a great example of barrier island restoration with some marsh, marsh uh, restoration thrown in there. Um, Here's an example of a, this is a panorama showing a building on stilts, which is one of the non-structural um, strategies of support. Uh, this is also, this is down on Grand Isle. This is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, or I'm sorry, the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries facility. And in the foreground, we have these oyster, uh, bags full of oyster shells that are being used for uh, oyster habitat reconstruction, which takes us up here. Uh, out in Chandelier Sound. And this is a, a, a project that Miro Foundation has been supporting, a uh, video about oyster barrier reef construction. This is taking, um, and again, this is uh, where, where in areas where there would be, have been uh, uh, oyster uh, reefs forming naturally, this is a process for accelerating that. This project is called the Chandelier Living Shoreline. We pretty much created a program to engage with welding students and coastal education students between Chalmette High and Nunez. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a breakwater in along the shoreline. It will reduce the fetch action. It'll reduce the erosion and it will start collecting sediment behind the basket. My saw my high school. This woman came up to me and told me I was a good candidate to do dual enrollment. So I'm going to pause there. Uh, you get a chance to look through all of these at, at length. So, but again, using uh, uh, the idea of building oyster reefs in a setting where they would be occurring uh, naturally. So that's another one of the restoration strategies you can see in the bottom left here. Um, and then uh, Bob talked about both sediment diversions and freshwater diversions, both very important concepts. So we have a visit to uh, Carnarvon to take a look at a freshwater diversion. The Carnarvon diversion channels freshwater rich with sediment from the Mississippi into an area called Big Mar. The water flows from the river through a siphon and down a canal. It displaces the brackish or salty water that had intruded into Big Mar over decades as wetlands closer to the Gulf were lost. The sediment rich water from the river has created conditions that have allowed wetland vegetation to thrive. Let's take a closer look at the siphon. Large underground pipes draw water from the river to flow under the levee and highway. The elevation of the canal is lower than the river so the flow of water can continue without pumping. So the part of the idea with this is to help people really visualize in their own minds what these processes look like. So the siphon, you know, you can be at Carnarvon. I've been there many times, uh, you know, the, 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 the water, this, the fresh water that's being diverted from the Mississippi uh, into the Big Mar area is passing underground. You can't see any of it. So, you know, how do these things really work is part of what we're, we're interested in showing. And then, you know, what does it look like to be in these environments? So this is a, one of our 360 videos. Uh, we're out uh, with support from the Pontchartrain Conservancy. Uh, this is a video and I'm navigating around it with my mouse. We're on this airboat cruising through uh, this, uh, these wetland areas that have entirely been created by the freshwater diversion that is bringing uh, fresh water from the Mississippi into an area that uh, had been um, uh, impacted by saltwater intrusion. So the water uh, had been so heavily uh, saline that uh, vegetation uh, native to this environment was unable to grow. So everything you're seeing here, all of the emergent vegetation 
uh, and the trees in the background have been able to grow here as a result of, of this diversion. So that's an example uh, of, of that diversion. And then we have a, a, a four part visualization here that just shows what that impact has looked like over time. So starting in 1989, before fresh water began flowing through the system, Big Mar was essentially an open water area. And you can see uh, 2010, 2015, and 2019, how that vegetation has grown back. This is not a sediment diversion. So this is just uh, reducing the salinity of the water in this area and the result of that. Then we're going to do a similar uh, look at a sediment diversion. So this uh, this point, this is going to be built out more, but this locates the mid Barataria diversion, uh, which is one of the major projects that's being enacted right now. And we will build a visualization around this image. So the Mississippi River is in the, in the bottom of the picture here. And the idea is the, the freshwater diversion is drawing water off the top of the river. So it's mostly just fresh water. There's some sediment in it, but it's mostly fresh water. That's what was happening at the Carnarvon diversion we were just looking at. Here, the river is able to, uh, it's, a, it's more of an open gate so that sediment, uh, which is accumulates more heavily at the, you know, at the lower part of the water column, is able to flow into this system, uh, and and through these gates and flood essentially do what the river historically has done when it would flood on a regular basis, which is bring in fresh sediment into these wetland areas. So we'll be visualizing that, and the final uh, image here shows the the areas uh, over time that, um, that, is, that will be restored through this process. So this is an image gallery uh, that will be illustrating that concept. Um, and then there, there are the structural uh, solutions. And we uh, have a series of videos uh, from the Army Corps, and I'm just gonna jump ahead here. The control house is built to provide protection from the storm, and it contains backup generators to provide power to operate the gates. In the control room, windows look out on the barge and sector gates at the Gulf Intracoastal Waterway. These windows provide a clear view as the operator watches the gates close. So I'll pause that there. So a whole series of these that uh, show how these vast um, structures were built and how they function in a storm. So the, they have uh, you know a number of different gates uh, throughout the area around New Orleans that are part of the flood protection system are modeled uh, in this uh, kind of a 3D model. So obviously not a natural system there that's providing protection, but a structural engineering solution. So that gives you a little feel for what's being put together here. There's, there's a lot more to come with this, but um, the idea is to vis enable people, uh, students, members of the general public to really visualize and understand uh, you know, what these solutions look like that are part of the lines of defense in this kind of interactive format. So you have all been very patient in, uh, in sitting through our uh, discussion or these series of presentations here. Uh, I'm going to pause, stop sharing, and um, and we'll in our time left, which is about ten minutes. Turn it back over to Tracy, and uh, Tracy, go ahead with with any questions and answers folks might have. Well, one of the the questions has been answered in the chat about where the scale model is. That's an incredible place, uh, really a cool, cool place to visit if you haven't been there. Uh, are they still, are they open to having kids come out or maybe they're not with COVID, they're not doing that? To, does anybody know if they're open right now? Um, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Let's see. The students inform me that COVID is over, over here. So um, we should be able to do that. I'm gonna look it up. <laughs> That's what one of my students said in class yesterday. They're like, COVID doesn't exist anymore. I was like, all right. <laughs> Things are changing a little bit, opening up. I will say that. It'd be all curious to see. But that if you can get there, it's a fantastic place. Um, uh, one of the questions that I had was, uh, is there a line of defense that's, uh, that's misunderstood or that uh, 
uh, Dr. Bob or Dinah, that if, uh, you know, there's, there's multiple lines, but is there one that uh, is maybe misunderstood or I don't want to say more important, but uh, could you talk about any uh, misunderstandings that might be out there? I'm going to defer to Bob. And Bob needs to. Well, I think uh, if I had to pick any, I would say that everybody down here knows what levies do. But I think that the average citizen would be surprised at uh, what the other lines of defense are. I really do. I just don't think that they, that the average person thinks about things like that. I know, Bob, uh, as you and I have talked about some of these ideas, you have made a point that the, the concept of diversions is often poorly understood, that sediment diversions versus freshwater diversions is something people don't have a clear distinction hey. about. Would you say that's true as well? Huge. That, that look, we go to public hearings. That, that there's a whole group of people that hate even hearing people talk about sediment diversions because they don't like what the freshwater diversions have done. And part of that, to be honest with you, is they don't trust government to operate them well. Literally, it, that's what it is, it's a mistrust of government. And when, uh, and, and when you go, if you have a public hearing and you want to talk about sediment diversions, everybody talks about freshwater diversions. And they don't seem to get the connection between the two different types. And the fact that if you allow uh, good scientists to operate these things, they can operate them efficiently. And, uh, you know, one of the examples is that I, that I bring up every once in a while is that uh, one of our leaders in, in this kind of work in this state uh, is adamant that he thinks that it, if we made a bigger sediment diversion, longer, that it would be better for the state. And when you say that to a crowd, they go nuts. They go, what do you mean, bigger is better? Well, the reason it's better is he knows exactly how long oysters can live in fresh with fresh water flowing over them. And he said, if you give me a bigger, what longer uh, diversion, then I can run it for a shorter period of time to get the work done to put the sediment in the marsh and the oysters will do quite fine. But he can't ever get that out of his mouth before people start screaming. So, you know, it's, it is very frustrating. I giggle only because it's so frustrating to have to be in a room like that talking about those kind of things. Also, oh, sorry, um, I just wanted to add that one of the um, problems with people's understanding of all of the lines of defense is that it's hard to get to places like barrier islands or salt marshes. You know, it isn't in people's uh, you know, most people who live in the city, it isn't in their experience. Even if you live in New Orleans, you may not get a chance to go even outside of the levee system very often. So when people come out to surf, which is still in New Orleans, but just outside the levee system, they get a chance to see that. And often it's for the first time. So it, you know, it's hard for people to visualize, uh, you know, work like John's work, doing these visualizations is so important but um even then you know getting people to places is even maybe more important